So tonight's Torah portion, Vaira, which translated means, and he appeared. So in the context of the Torah portion, it's referring to the Lord. The Lord appeared to Abraham. Now this is a very interesting Torah portion because there are a lot of, there, there are a lot of opinions about what actually happened with Abraham who appeared to him and, and, and what the whole basis of that appearance was all about. So I'm going to share on that here in a moment, but before, before I share specifically on that, we're going to look at three points of interest tonight in tonight's Torah portion. Tonight's Torah portion is Genesis chapter 18, 1 to 22, 24. So just a few chapters, but they're, they're brimming with all sorts of interesting things that we can look at, some of which I'm not going to be able to put emphasis on. So, but there's, there are three points of interest that I want to bring to light, and let's begin. So, the Lord appeared to Abraham. Let's talk about his appearance to Abraham. Now, we believe that the narrative is based on an actual, literal appearance of God that God actually appeared to Abraham at the oaks, at that oak tree, under that oak tree. Which oak tree was it? The oak tree of, uh, not memory, the other one. It's in here, we'll talk about it. So we believe that there was an actual appearance of God. God manifest and interacted with Abraham. Now, in the Jewish world, that's not so readily accepted. Anyone knows why? why? Why does the Jewish people, in regards to, to, to Jewish uh, rabbinical teachings, why do they not accept that that can possibly be the Lord himself? Because he has no shape, he has no form, he's not supposed to manifest himself in, a, in the form of a person. So it could not have been the Lord, Yud, He, Vav, He. And so, strictly speaking, they were correct in saying that. But there's a side of this that I want to draw reference to as it relates to God's manifestation. God has chosen, from now our perspective, a Christian perspective, God has chosen, yud heh vav -He, the Father himself, has chosen to manifest himself in the earth through his Son. His Son, Yeshua Jesus, who is not the Father but the Son, has been appointed by God to be God's manifestation, his vessel of appearances in the earth. He is the word of God. God has chosen to speak through him. God has chosen to effect redemption through the person of his son, Yeshua. We believe that it was his son, Yeshua, in a pre-incarnated form that appeared to Abraham. So, who's right and who's wrong? We really don't need to deliberate too much, we, we, have, we, we have our opinion, and our opinion is firmly in place. But let's consider the Jewish perspective for a while. Uh, so so they, they would maintain that the Lord appeared and spoke to Abraham in conjunction with three men that showed up to speak with him. So you understand their, their position. It was, in fact, the Oaks of Mamre, which is in Hebron. So they would say that the Lord, yes, yud he vav -He, as it says there in chapter 1, in chapter, uh, excuse me, 18 verse 1, now the Lord appeared to him, Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. So you can't, you can't do much with that. The Lord, yud he vav -He, appeared to him. They would maintain that that appearance was not physical. It was in the same way that he appeared to Abraham in other times. But then, following that, three men appeared to him, which is what we see in the text. So maybe we should read the text, Genesis chapter 18, 1 to 8. Let's read 1 to 8, and we'll be able to follow the narrative here and maybe understand more clearly what actually happened. So there is a pressure, and the pressure is, the Lord appeared to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, when he was at Haran and told him to go to Ur of the Chaldeans. So it is believed that God spoke to him on the inner being. God didn't appear to him in a physical form. And the same thing in Genesis chapter 15. We read about this last week when God appeared to Abraham and confirmed the promises of a son to him. Now he appeared to him again, but 
we see the added appearance of three men. Let's read. Now the Lord appeared to him by the oak of memory while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, now that word, dear Lord, is not yud heh vav heh. That word, dear Lord, in the Bible is Yehovah. Excuse me, Adonai, or Master. So, in other words, he said, My Master, my Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. So, from a Jewish perspective, these are three men, messengers, three men, that appeared to Abraham, not the Lord himself. Because that second word, Lord, there is Adonai, not Yehovah. Please let, uh, please, let a little please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may eat, that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, so do as you have said. So these three men said, okay. You want to serve us some food? Go, go ahead and do it. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make bread cakes. Now, a bread cake. What's a bread cake? Basically a pita, and you still have them in the, in the Middle East. A uh, pita that's about that size and about that thick, a bread cake. So she took some measures of flour. She ran off. This is what she was supposed to do and make some very large pitas. And, and together with that also, and Abraham also ran to the herd and took, took a tender and choice calf and gave it to his servant, to the servant, and he hurried and prepared it. He took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them, and he was standing uh, by them under the tree as they ate. So these men stood there for quite a while. They stayed there for an extended period of time, long enough for the bread to be baked, the, the bread cakes, and for the animal to be slaughtered, processed, and prepared. So they were there for how long, you think? What do you think? About four hours? Maybe five hours or something? So, so they sat there and probably had conversations with Abraham for that period of time. So at this point, there's no evidence that, in fact, the Lord did appear to Abraham as a person, as one of those men. So it's not clear at this point. Now, later on, and I'm not going to belabor this too much, but later on, we see that two of the men following their, their fellowship, their, their, their meal fellowship, two of the men went off to Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? We'll talk about that here in a moment. But two of the men went off to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they became the angels, while one of the men stayed with Abraham. And what was, what was, Abraham, what was Abraham's interaction with that one who stayed back? Well, I don't have the time right now to dig deep into it. It's as simple as reading some of the other verses, but what, what we're going to see here in a moment is that the person that he stayed back, that stayed back and interacted with Abraham was referred to as yud heh vav -He. That it was the Lord, yud heh vav -He, who stayed back and interacted with him. While the two men went off to Sodom and Gomorrah, they were angels that were involved in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So, the, 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 the deduction is that these three men that appeared to Abraham sat there for hours, and then ate and broke bread with Abraham, milk and, and calf meat, hopefully it wasn't veal, but it, it was tender calf, uh, bread and milk and curds. What's curds? Curds and whey? Cheese. Cheese, right. So they sat there, they ate meat, and they ate dairy together with, with Abraham, and they all had a wonderful time. Hours of fellowship together, it, was, it must have been a wonderful time where suddenly, I guess, Abraham began to realize that one of these men are not just Adonai, because he begins to, 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 to negotiate concerning the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah with this one who is referred to as Yehovah. 
So what's the conclusion? That one of those men were in fact Yehovah in the flesh. And we know the Lord in the flesh is in fact Yeshua. So the conclusion is from our perspective, not from a Jewish perspective, you would win no friends uh, in the Jewish community if you were to maintain this position, but from our perspective, Jesus appeared to Abraham in the pre-incarnated form as a man, broke bread with him, had fellowship with him for an extended period of time, and then he allowed Abraham to negotiate concerning Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah with him. As he sent off the, the, the angels of destruction that would bring destruction upon, upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we often think of the angels as the ones who brought the destruction, but they were not. They were there to do what? To save Lot and his family. But their appearance in Sodom and Gomorrah signified that it was about to be destroyed. And they were angels. And so it's interesting the interaction that the angels had with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, they, 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 there was violence between the angels and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? All right so so, so now, now let's talk about why actually why the Lord appeared to Abraham with, with angels. We would say, well, he was on his way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and so he stopped over and spoke to, to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre. But no, he actually stopped or went to Abraham to confirm to Abraham the promises that he had already given Abraham about a son. That was his purpose for showing up at the Oaks of Mamre. Uh, the, the situation with Sodom and Gomorrah was secondary. So let's read here now, in chapter 18 again. What do I want to read? And 9 to 15. As to the reason for the appearance, let's read. Then they said to him, where is Sarah? Interesting that they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, uh, there in the tent, and he said, I, surely, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was, was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being also old. So Sarah laughed. Apparently, we're going to see here that she laughed loud enough for the men to hear. Now, she laughed. And as a result of that, the child will be named Laughter. Now, the Lord is going to confront Sarah about laughter. Why did she laugh? So let's read. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being, being old also? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Now note, God here is speaking to Abraham. In a few moments, we'll see that he actually would eventually speak to Sarah. But he's speaking to Abraham concerning Sarah's laughter. What can we take away from that? That Abraham was in a position of accountability and responsibility. He had responsibility for his wife. He was in a position of authority over Sarah, so God is holding him responsible for her, for her actions. The truth is, it was Abraham who first laughed. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 17, when God spoke to him about having a son, he laughed. And this was a considerable time before. So he laughed, and as a result, Sarah also laughed. So who was responsible for that show of, of, of uh, cavalier? about what God has promised, Abraham was. Abraham was. Sarah laughed, but Abraham initially laughed, and he was responsible. And that's why God addressed the question to Abraham. Why, again, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, shall I indeed bear a child when I am old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you, and at this time next year, Sarah will have a son. So now... This, this person that Abraham is interacting with is more carefully identifying himself as the Lord. You see, it's becoming obvious that Abraham is not interacting to master or a master. 
it becomes obvious that he's interacting with God himself, the Lord himself. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, <laughs> uh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. So the Lord now turns to Sarah after she denied it and lied. And he says, no, you did laugh. So that was a, that was a rebuke, right? And what happened? Well, the next year, of course, the word that the Lord had was fulfilled. And Sarah bore a child and they named him laughter because of Abraham's laughter, right? So that's, just, that's why the angels were there to affirm to Abraham what God will do with the promise that he gave to Abraham way back in chapter 15. So, but we see here a very, very, a very puzzling issue for some people as to who those men were. Again, from our perspective, it seems pretty clear these were angelic beings, two of them, and one of them was the pre-incarnated Yeshua Jesus who appeared. His initiative was two at this point, to speak a word of confirmation to Abraham, secondly, to, 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 oversee, to oversee the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so we all know the story about Abraham, how he negotiated with God, the Lord, over the situation with Lot. What did he say? Would you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if they were, you know, the narrative? Ten good men in the city. And, and it went back and forth. And finally, the Lord said, I will save Lot and his family. And this is what happened. The second point of interest I want to consider here is the destruction of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, of course, and the birth of two nations as a result of what God did when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and saved Lot. And I think we know the story well. I'm not going to spend too much time here. What happened? Well, the angels went to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom, I think, was the actual place that they went to because I think, I think he lived in Sodom. And he, he appeared at the city gate. Apparently, Lot's, Lot's place was close to the city gate. They appeared at the city's gate, and, uh, and, and they went into Lot, and they began to interact with Lot. And the men of Sodom saw these two men coming in, and they wanted to have interaction with them. Not so good interaction, but they, they wanted to have interaction with the men. And they came, they knocked on, on, uh, on Lot's door, demanding that the two men should be sent out. And, of course, you know the story. Lot said, no, 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 I'll take my daughters before you, you, mess, you interfere with these two men. And it went on for a while. Finally, the two men, the two angels, went out and they struck the men of Sodom and Gomorrah and secured Lot and his family, his wife and his children. And the time came for, for Sodom and Gomorrah to be destroyed. And the two men led Lot, his wife, and their two daughters out from the city. And what happened, of course, you know the story well. They were told not to look back uh, whenever that destruction would descend upon Sodom and Gomorrah and his wife, uh, Lot's wife, looks back and she becomes a pillar of salt. We know the story well. Now, what, what happens following that? Well, the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was so broad and so expansive that Lot and his two daughters were convinced that everything had been destroyed. The entire world was ruined. And they went into the mountains of, uh, of what is today Jordan, and they were isolated there by themselves, believing that the whole world had been destroyed. Because the cities of, Sodom, the, cities of the Dead Sea, what is now the Dead Sea, uh, there were five cities, not just Sodom and Gomorrah. So there were five cities that were destroyed. So the destruction was pretty extensive, right? And so they all believed it was done. There is no hope for humanity. It's up to us. So they saw themselves as, as progenitors for future races of humanity. Uh, his daughters did anyway. And what happened? They got him drunk, I think. Now, where did the wine come from? Uh, so when they fled Sodom, I guess they took with them uh, skins of wine or something. But they, they went into a cave and, and they got uh, intoxicated. They slept with him and they had sons. They both conceived and they had two sons who were Moab and Ammon. And they became the Moabites and the Ammonites. So two nations of people came into being as Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Now, there is some, de there is some deliberation or some concern about whether 
they, they should have come into existence. Uh, that's a debate. <laughs> uh, today, there, are, there, 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 there is a whole nation of people, namely the Jordanian people, that are descendants of Moab and Ammon. So could we say that that people is an entire mistake, should have never been? No, we can't. We should never be that bold to say anything like that. So, but, but the situation with Lot and his daughters, uh, we can look at it and, and sort of judge it and say, it's, oh, it was wrong, it was evil, and perhaps it was. But two nations of people came into existence because of it. Now, does God hate the Jordanians? Does he hate the descendants of Moab and Ammon? No, he does not. But very clearly in the prophets, he will bring judgment upon them. Why? Not because of their ancestors, not because of the way they came into existence. He will bring judgment upon the descendants of Ammon and Moab because of their treatment of Israel. Now that's very clear. Three of the prophets in the Bible says the very same thing. That the descendants of Moab and Ammon, who are descendants of Lot, will be judged as a result of their treatment of Israel. Not because of Lot and what his daughters did, right? So we shouldn't look at that action and say, oh, it was wrong, it shouldn't have happened. Who are we to say that anyway? Nevertheless, I want, you, I want, I want to make this statement. Judgment in the Bible, we, we think very detrimentally, don't we? We think in very detrimental terms. Judgment in the Bible isn't necessarily the, the, the annihilation of a people or the subjugation of a people. Judgment, many, many times, when God begins to judge the nations, He's judging the leadership. He's judging the, the government of the people, in many cases. The leadership is what he's interested in. And he's bringing the people to a better place of standing. That's a more proper way of looking at judgment. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of the prophets says that God's going to bless the Philistines, and he's going to make them his people. Other prophets come, comes along and says, well, God's going to judge the Philistines. So how do, we, how do we negotiate between the two prophets? Very simple. God will both judge the Philistines, correct them, and he will also make them his people. So we have to look at it in, in that light because it's biblical. We may not like to hear it, but who are we to judge God's word, really? If the word says it, that settles it. God also refers to Egypt as his people as well, and Assyria as his people. So we have to correct that thought pattern that judgment means subjugation, annihilation. Judgment means correction. How many times in my life have I been corrected? Uh, many times? Many, many times. How many times have I been corrected by God? Many times I've been corrected by God, by the Holy Spirit. I'm standing before you. So in many cases, Correction or judgment leads to redemption. And, and that's, that's a reality we have to come to terms with. God will judge the nations, but not detrimentally necessarily, but for the sake of redemption. Ultimately, God wants to redeem the nations. God's not a brutal des despot who wants to just beat up on everyone. <laughs> Even though the story tonight about Sodom and Gomorrah Sodom and, Sodom and Gomorrah is detrimental judgment. Yes. God wanted to put an end to that activity. He wanted to make a statement. But the people lived on. The people lived on. I'll, I'll venture to say that there are many descendants of the Canaanites who lived in, around the Dead Sea that, that, are, that are alive today. So, so judgment isn't always detrimental. Judgment usually is correction and for the sake of redemption. The book of Revelation, it's all about judgment, right? Seems pretty dire. Seems pretty detrimental. But the end of the book of Revelation is that the nations are redeemed, corrected, and redeemed. Right? So we must keep that in mind. So, so the second point of interest here has to do with Sodom and Gomorrah and the fact that two nations of people come into existence after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Ammonites and the Moabites. Now, when Israel came through, uh, came up the Jordan Valley, I should say, to make, to make their entry into the land of Israel, Moses extended an olive branch to the Ammonites and the Moabites, right? 
He said, we're not here for war. You're cousins of us, and we're not here for war. We're here to enter into the land. Just let us pass. What did the Ammonites and the Moabites say? Not a chance. And so the conflict between Israel and the people of Jordan, who are today the people of Jordan, uh, Ammon and Moab, is an ancient one. It goes back to the time of Israel coming into the land of Israel. They were afraid of Israel and did not allow Israel to pass by without conflict. Right? So, so the history there is not so good. The third point of interest that I want to, to, to end with tonight has to do with, of course, tonight's Torah portion also introduces God's sacrifice, God's approach that he expected of Abraham at Mount Moriah. So God spoke to Abraham after Isaac was born. So tonight's Torah portion really begins with the conception of Isaac. All right? this, this conception would have occurred shortly after the three men would have, would have uh, left Abraham. Right? Because a year from now, the Lord said, I will return and Sarah will have a son. So perhaps, perhaps within a month, or two, a month or two after this experience, uh, Abraham's experience, Sarah conceived. So tonight's Torah portion begins with the conception of Sarah, of, uh, of uh, Isaac, and it ends with that, that incredible occasion when God command, or, or instructed Abraham to take Isaac up to Moriah. And, and so we'll talk about that, the last, the last part of tonight's Torah portion now, deals with an offering. Now what does the word offering to us mean in English? Sacrifice. So when we hear the word offering, we hear sacrifice, right? Sacrifice, like I've said so many times, is not really a good word. In about a week and two days, uh, much of the world will be celebrating Halloween. Most Hallows Eve, right? So we, we, I think we all know some of the history of Halloween. We know it's not, it's not Christian. It's not good. Uh, what did the Druids do at the time of uh, the Most Hallows Eve? What, what was their practice? sacrifices, offerings. Uh, who were they making sacrifices to? Well, I think they had like 500 gods or something that they made sacrifices to. Some of the sacrifices were in fact human sacrifices. Uh, much of it were animal sacrifices. Altogether they were blood sacrifices. So the Druids, who were the holy people of the Celtics, the Celts, uh, were the ones who, they were the religious leaders of the Celtic people. The Celtic people spanned from France, the Ghouls, all the way to Ireland, even into the Nordic regions of Europe. And they were all Celts. They were not, they were not necessarily evil people, but the Druids were evil. They were pagans, and they practiced pagan practices. Halloween is one of those. So the whole world's getting ready to celebrate Halloween. You go to many churches, and they have their pumpkins outside, and it's all about, really, Halloween. They try to Christianize Halloween by saying it's a, it's a fall festival. Okay. Uh, there are no fall festivals in the Bible except Sukkot. All right, so, so Halloween is about a sacrifice, about sacrifices. So the pagans understand what sacrifices are. Sacrifices are relevant in the pagan world. So we look at the sacrifices that are mentioned in the Bible and that Isaac was to be a sacrifice. And we try to make a comparison there, but you cannot. You cannot. Only God can ordain the offering of an animal or a blood offering for the remittance of sin. Only God is able to do this. Why? Why, why is it that only God is in a position to offer the rendering of an animal's life for forgiveness of sin. The pagans, they go through this practice of sacrificing to gain favor from their gods. That's the purpose of, of the pagans, the, the, the people that are involved in witchcraft. When they make an offering, a blood offering, where bait an animal or something else, it's to gain favor from their gods. God himself was the very first person to offer an animal life. He was the first to spill blood. That happened in the Garden of Eden. We know the story. Adam transgressed against God. He sinned, and God provided an animal skin 
for his covering. That's what it says. God provided an animal skin. So where did, that, where, did that, where did that animal come from? Where did the skin come from? God offered the first blood offering. And the word offering in Hebrew is choban. The word choban means approach. And this is a better way to look at sacrifices, approaches, or means by which we can approach. The means by which I can approach God is because of what he has provided for me in his son, Jesus. That's why Jesus, like we've, like we've said many times, is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way by which I can approach God. And he was and is that Lamb of God. Like we've said so many times in Genesis chapter 3, when God provided a covering for Adam and Eve, that covering and the blood that was spilt so that covering would be provided was symbolic of the Lamb of God, symbolic of what he, Jesus himself would do, what God will provide. So God provide, God is the only person, person that can provide a covering through, a, through an offering, through a sacrifice, and he did. So here now we see him, God, directing Abraham to take his son to Moriah and render him there as an offering to God, which is different, which is unexpected. That the God who provided a lamb from the world's foundation, did he not provide the lamb of God from the world's foundation? Isn't that what Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 says? That's what it says. The lamb slain from the world's foundation, referring back to that animal skin that was provided for Adam and Eve, symbolic of the lamb of God that would be offered up on the cross 4,000 years later. So, God is asking Abraham to do something that the pagans were doing, you see. Because at this time, the worship of Molech involved the sacrificing of your sons. And so here now, Abraham must have been a bit confused. But as confused as he must have been, he was faithful to God's word. He simply obeyed God's instructions. Which is amazing, right? It shows incredible trust on behalf of Abraham, but God, from the standpoint of that, that, that direction that he gave to Abraham, is like a pagan god. He's like Molech. He's instructing Abraham to do something that the pagans were doing, to offer up their own sons. But nevertheless, God did come to Abraham. Some people say it was a test, and perhaps it was. You might be able to say it was a test. It certainly was a test of faith to see if Abraham would, in fact, walk it out. But more than a test, it was a picture. God was providing an allegorical picture for us to see. More than a test. Yes, it was a test. But God wanted us to see with our eyes in a very practical way what he himself would do. And let's, let's talk about that. So, the next two Torah portions would involve Isaac and Rebekah. And we're going to talk about Isaac from the standpoint, and Rebekah, from the standpoint of allegorical types. That Isaac is an allegorical type, an archetype, which is a big word, but it simply means a type. Isaac is an archetype of Messiah. And Rebekah is an archetype of the church. We'll, we'll, dis we'll, we'll examine that next week. So Isaac is a type of Messiah. And this is what the story is really wanting to, this is what God really wants to reflect to us in this story, which is a very important thing for us to see. So let's read now in, uh, in chapter 22. That's why I told you tonight's Torah portion is brimming with all sorts of really wonderful things that we can talk about. But this is important. So Isaiah chapter, uh, Isaiah, Genesis chapter 22, I'm going to read 1 and 2 for us. Now Abraham has a son. His son Isaac, some believe at this time, is 34 years old. Uh, based on the math and based on the age of Abraham when Isaac was uh, conceived and so on and when Sarah actually died, we've concluded that Isaac was probably about 34 years old when God instructed him to take him to Moriah. 
which is interesting because how old was Messiah Jesus when he went to Moriah? He was about 34 years old, 33 or 34 years old. So do you see that there's a correlation there? Uh, he was 30 years old when his ministry began, Jesus, and three years into his ministry, some say three and a half years into his ministry, he went to Moriah and became the Lamb of God. So Isaac, according to the, 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 the time factor here, went to Moriah when he was 34 years old. Again, the, the typology there is relevant. So, let's read chapter 22, 1 and 2. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. So there is a test. And said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. And he said, now, uh, and he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on, on one of the mountains which I will tell you. Very interesting instructions. Take your son, Isaac, the son that God had provided for him, the son that you love, and take him to Moriah and a mountain where God would, will show him, tell him to, to, to offer him on. Now, he's a burnt offering. Isaac is to be a burnt offering. What do we learn concerning the offerings in Leviticus chapter 1 to 5? That God has effectively five types of offerings. Now, in the Garden of Eden, okay, Garden of Eden, when God provided the covering, the skin for Adam and Eve, what type of offering was that? Based on the offerings that we see in Leviticus chapter 1 to 5, It wasn't a burnt offering because all of it would have been consumed. It was a khatar, a khatat, a sin offering. A sin offering because of Adam's transgression. With the sin offering, not all of the animal is thrown onto the fire. Parts of it are kept aside, like the skin, the, 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 the intestines, and so on. The rest of it is offered on the fire, and some of it is eaten by the priest. So... That offering in the garden was a sin offering. Makes sense, doesn't it? When you look at the offerings again, Leviticus 5 to 1, you see, this, you see this progression of different types of offerings. You have, first of all, the trespass offering, uh, which is called the asam. And I, I feel sure that the word ashame comes from the word asam in Hebrew. You have the asam, which is a trespass offering. You have the chatat, which is the sin offering. And then you have the shelamim, which is the peace offering. And then in Leviticus chapter 2, you have the mencha, which is the meal offering. But then you have the most important of all the offerings, and it is an ola, which is a burnt offering. Sometimes referred to as a whole burnt offering. Why a burnt offering or a whole burnt offering? Because all of the animal is offered up, all of it, complete. So God instructed Abraham to take his son to be a whole burnt offering. Now that's why, again, when Abraham heard this, he must have been thinking about the Amalekites, the people that worship Moloch. Because to worship Moloch, you had to throw your son into the fire complete. In other words, Moloch demanded whole burnt offerings. And so God is instructing, instructing Abraham here to take Isaac to be a burnt offering, a whole burnt offering. Now, you say, okay, it's a test. But it's more than a test because, you see, Jesus became a whole burnt offering symbolically. He became the Olah. In fact, on Moriah, 2,000 years after Abraham carried out this action, on Moriah... Jesus himself fulfilled all of the sacrifices, all of the korbanot, all of the approach, approaches were fulfilled by Yeshua when he went up to Moriah, when God himself took his only beloved. Now it's interesting that that, that word is used there, that verbiage, take your son, your only son, the one whom you love. God himself said on the day that Yeshua was baptized, what did he say? This is my son whom I love. You see? There, there's an identity there with Abraham and Isaac. It's difficult not to see it. 
But it's even more wonderful because Yeshua Jesus becomes a whole burnt offering. I don't mean that he was laid on a stone and burnt completely, but the giving completely of himself rendered him to be a whole burnt offering. Providing all, providing all atonement. And he was a burnt offering. So in that sense. So, so you see, the, the story here is really about Yeshua Jesus being this incredible offering that God himself would offer. Just as he wanted Abraham to make that offering. Again, it was a test, yes. But it was more so an allegorical picture that God wanted to paint. He wanted us to see what he himself would do. You know, uh, God, God just simply told Abraham to take your son and go. Go to Moriah, to a specific spot on Moriah that I will show you. Just go. Abraham picked up his things and he left. Along the way, Isaac, now he's 34 years old, he's not 12, so he's, he's rationalizing things, he's, he's considering what's happening here, he's 34 years old. And he asks a question, let's, let's read about that in chapter 22, uh, 7 and 8. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. And, and, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So after a while now, Isaac is saying, Okay, this is, this is not comfortable. There's no lamb, there's fire and wood, no lamb. And here is how Abraham responded. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. So that statement is very important. It relates to the allegorical picture that's being painted here. Uh, Abraham said it, and it was prophetic. God himself will provide the lamb. God himself actually would be the lamb in his son Yeshua. So, so consider it. The one who appeared to Abraham, pre-incarnated son of God, Jesus, and announced to Abraham that he would have a son, and he'll come back in one year to confirm this, that same one who also spoke to Abraham about going to Moriah was the one who would incarnate in human form and go to Moriah. And he did every bit of that under God's instructions. When Yeshua went to the cross, he did it obediently. The obedient factor is very important for us to see. Because if we do not see the obedience of Messiah in going to the cross, we will not recognize the faith by which he justified us. Let me say it again. If we do not recognize very clearly the obedience in Christ as he went to the Via Dolorosa, as he went to Calvary, to Galgata, to Moriah, if we don't see that obedience being walked out, we are not going to understand the faith by which we are justified because we are justified by Jesus' faith. Because he believed, because Jesus believed that he was the Lamb of God and his obedience to the Word of God will provide forgiveness of sin, because of that, he became the one who justified. And I'm, I'm, of course, you can recognize what I'm saying here from Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 3. Jesus became the justifier. By his own faith, he became justified and provided for God atonement for all. And he was the one that spoke to Abraham. He was the one that tested Abraham on behalf of God, knowing very well that he himself will be the one that would become that whole burnt offering. God is marvelous in his storytelling. He tells wonderful stories in the Bible, allegorical pictures that you have to dig into. You have to, you have to ask the Holy Spirit to, to make it clear to me because I don't understand what this is about. And when you ask, he gives. When you ask, he provides. There are wonderful, listen, the Bible, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Torah is overflowing with allegorical pictures. Beautiful allegorical pictures that are so relevant, so important for us. They don't exist in the New Testament. 
but they exist. They're all over the, the Tanakh. They're all over the, what we call the Old Testament. And it's incredible to me, so many powerful stories, allegorical references and pictures, symbol, symbolism that's so important to us, and Christianity, by, by and large, ignores it. That's the Old Covenant. We need to focus on the New Covenant only. Isn't that a tragedy? It's a tragedy. What a wonderful... And, and we're going to see these, these symbolic pictures, these allegorical pictures, over and over and over. They're all over. They're replete in the Tanakh. And they're so powerful. We Christians, we deny ourselves such insight, such blessings by just ignoring the Old Testament. We don't need it. So, Jesus, he became that whole burnt offering. He became the Lamb of God. That's why he is the Lamb of God. When Abraham said God himself will provide a, 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 an offering, he was referring to Jesus himself. God himself provided his only beloved so that we might be saved. And the entire world might have redemption, might know redemption. So the Moabites and the Ammonites will be redeemed. They will be judged. Correction will come. And they will be redeemed. The nation of Jordan will experience redemption because of what the Lamb did. That's important. All the nations will have redemption, will know redemption because Jesus, Yeshua, became that offering, that kobanot, on behalf of God. I believe without, without much doubt that the very spot, the very physical location that God guided Abraham to on Moriah was in fact what we call Golgotha, the place of the skull. I am convinced of it. Why would I be convinced of it? Because that's where he himself would offer his own son on that exact same spot. As you know as well, I am also convinced that that's where the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was. That same exact spot is where that tree was located. It would be difficult for me to prove that. But it's my faith, my belief. Why do I believe that? Because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is where that sin, that original sin, was committed. Where else would God determine what other physical location would he determine that that sin should be completely done away with? So the curse upon humanity occurred at that same spot. God determined that he would reverse the curse at the very same location. I believe that the, the, the tree of life was located on the Temple Mount. So in the Garden of Eden, you had the tree of life, and not too far away, you had the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where that sin was committed, and where that sin was also provided for. God is incredibly consistent throughout the Bible. You know, it's one of the, the most remarkable things about God that we see. He is deliberately consistent throughout his revelation. And he provided for us complete atonement. Gave us a wonderful picture of that in Isaac being taken to Moriah. A picture of what he himself will do. God himself provided a lamb so that we can have life and no salvation experience deliverance and redemption. God is gracious. God is wonderful. Yes, he is also judge. He will bring correction, but his purpose is never to, to, to bring detriment upon humanity. His purpose is always to bring life and to redeem. So it's a perspective on God that we must have. Uh, if we're to reflect the real grace of God, if we are to reflect God's mercy and his love and his goodness. We must see God from this perspective. That yes, he is judge. Yes, he will correct the nations. But he's also bringing redemption. And this is where God's heart is. To redeem, to save, to bring life. So, Shabbat Shalom.